pill and decompression sickness or birth control pills? Uh, what about diving and pregnancy? We know the answer is no, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Are there any issues with breastfeeding? What about things like cosmetic or reconstructive surgery? Um, are there changes that women need to worry about as they go through menopause, and especially as they, if they develop osteoporosis? And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, cardiovascular health as well, because I'm a cardiologist and that's kind of what I do. Uh, this picture on the right is uh, Brian K. Cook, uh, who is in Abaco, Bahamas. This shot I uh, took of him is about 2,500 feet or 3,000 feet back uh, in Dan's cave in Abaco, Bahamas. It's absolutely beautiful. And that's not rock. All of that is crystal. Uh, so you notice when the light's reflecting there, kind of on the mid portion on the left there, it's kind of glowing. All those things will glow if you light them with a, light them with a light. So a very cool place. One of the prettiest places on earth, in my opinion. Okay. Men versus women. Let's see if I can get this to play. As we all know, men and women are different. Uh, you can put men and women in the same situation, and they'll have a totally different reaction, uh, as evidenced uh, by whoops, by this. If I can get it to play, here we go. I hope you can hear that. <laughs> so I think uh, we all would agree that men and women will take the same situation and, and interpret it a little bit differently. But okay, so as far as women and decompression sickness, um, three factors bear consideration. One is, is there an overall difference between men and women under the same decompression stress? Uh, is there a change in decompression uh, illness during a normal reproductive cycle? Uh, and is there any kind of change in risk with oral contraception? As far as men versus women, the data is very conflicting and it's all retrospective. We don't think there's any real difference, but uh, basically what happened was there was some research done back in the 80s of Navy divers. Uh, obviously there's not a lot of women Navy divers back then. There were 28 women, 487 men. Uh, they looked at 878 training dives with equal representation of exposures and saw no real difference. However, that led to another study in 1992 uh, in Australia, where they looked at 111 cases of decompression illness, uh, and these were just uh, recreational divers, and they found that women had what they thought was a 4.3 times greater incidence of type 2 decompression illness than men, and that got everyone's concerned, and that's kind of where this issue kind of came about. Uh, Dick Van at uh, Duke uh, and the Divers Alert Network uh, looked at the Dan flying after diving data and found that women did have more type two decompression illness and had more residual symptoms after treatment than men, but they didn't know if that may be a higher incidence just because of, if, or maybe just a reporting bias that women were more likely to report their symptoms and men were more likely to neglect them or not report them. So it's really, that's kind of unclear. Uh, Dr. St. Ledger Dallas uh, et al, who has done a lot of this work um, in aviation, space and environmental medicine in 2002, sent out questionnaires and they had 2,250 questionnaires, 53% men, 47% women. They found initially that it looked like women had about a 1.67 times greater incidence of decompression illness than men, but that was before controlling for the diving patterns. When they controlled for diving patterns, it actually turned out that men had a higher incidence of decompression illness. So this data is very confusing and we really don't think there's any real difference in risk between men and women when on the same profiles. Um, Hagberg reported in 2003, the same sort of thing. They found an incidence of decompression illness of 1.5 per 1,000 dives for men and 1.27 for women, that was no difference. And the differences in dive profile makes it impossible to really draw any real firm uh, conclusions based simply on gender among scuba divers. The menstrual cycle, however, may have something to do with uh, changes. This is, um, from a medical standpoint, this is what uh, the, your hormones do uh, through a normal 28-day cycle. Uh, you see that you've got this baseline level of testosterone, which peaks uh, around the ovulatory phase. Your estrogen levels kind of go up, uh, peaking at around 13 days. Uh, and then there's another peak later uh, around the third week. And you see progesterone that kind of slowly goes up through the cycle, peaking it again at the third week and then coming down. And this is what the normal 28-day uh, menstrual cycle looks like from a hormone standpoint. The literature, this is a, uh, from the textbook. There's a couple of pages of these I'm going to show you. And this is looking at all the studies trying to determine whether there is uh, uh, incidence of increased 
decompression illness at various times of the menstrual cycle. You'll see some of these were with diving, uh, some of them were with altitude, some of them with hyperbaric chamber dives. So uh, they looked at a whole bunch of things. These did not show a whole lot of difference. Uh, there were some, however, that if you look at um, the highest incidence was, looks like it was within the uh, early part of the menstrual cycle. So here in altitude, uh, the greatest probability was on day two. Uh, in diving DCI, 35% of women with symptoms uh, were within the first five days of the menstrual cycle. Um, and it looked also like if you look at the third one down, that the risk may be dependent on the phase. So again, they showed the first week was the lowest uh, and the, excuse me, was the highest and the, and the lowest uh, risk was within week three. Um, and the same thing was found in other uh, cycles. Again, look at the last one down there, again, by Dr. St. Leger Dallas, uh, highest risk within the first week of a 28 day cycle, lowest risk within week three. Not that you need to not dive on the first week of your menstrual cycle, but just be aware there is statistically a little bit of, a, of an increased risk early in the menstrual cycle. How about birth control pills? This becomes very, very difficult. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is because women on birth control pills have a pharmaceutically driven cycle as opposed to a natural 28 day cycle. So when you do studies uh, of these women, most of the studies have been done assuming that the menstrual cycle is still 28 days. Uh, but we know that's not true. Uh, again, Dr. St. Ledger Dallas uh, looked in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology back in 2007. Of, out of 153 women on birth control pills, uh, looked over 3,000 menstrual cycles. They found that while 42% had a classic 28-day cycle, the other 58% varied between 21 days and 60 days. So you can imagine with those kind of changes, trying to decide what week of a presumed 28-day cycle you would have an increased risk of decompression illness would be very, very difficult and very, very confusing. So we don't have a lot of data on birth control pills. So currently it's felt that from that standpoint, the relationship between decompression illness uh, and the menstrual cycle is most evident in women not on birth control pills. It looks like the greatest risk is within the first week of the menstrual cycle and the lowest risk is in week three. The risk relationship for women on birth control pills is unclear like we talked about because it's difficult to control things for the data. Uh, and the mechanism of risk across the menstrual cycle is unknown, uh, but probably due to those hormonal fluctuations that we saw on the first slide. Um, pregnancy, there's very little uh, human data on the effects of hyperbaric oxygen on the fetus because from an ethical standpoint, we don't do that. Uh, and because the, the feeling always has been, if you're pregnant, you should not die. However, we do have some data. Uh, the first data was from back in 1980. Uh, they looked at 109 women uh, who were diving before and during their pregnancy. Um, 69 women dived before pregnancy but stopped when pregnancy was diagnosed. This was not obviously randomized, this was just observational. What they did find is the children of women who dived during pregnancy uh, did have lower birth weights. Uh, there were more respiratory difficulties in those uh, children uh, and there were birth defects that were noted. Um, there was a hemivertebrae, there was a, one person had, had an absence of a hand, uh, the trigger septal defects, coartation of the aorta, and pyloric stenosis, lots of different things that we see anyway. The one thing of that absence of a hand was concerning someone hypothesized that could have been potentially a bubble uh, during formation of the hand and all of a sudden that, that, that stopped the formation of the hand. Uh, and there were no uh, birth defects in the non-dive group. Again, a very, very small study. Uh, but again, the idea was uh, if people become pregnant, women become pregnant, they should stop diving. They looked uh, at the outcomes of pregnancies during where the mother dived inadvertently uh, or deliberately. This is retrospective data uh, between 1990 and 1992, followed by prospective, meaning they're following them going forward. Uh, the 1990 and 92 was just chart review, 96 to 2000, they, they took people and followed them for those four years. They looked at 129 women who were diving during pregnancy. Uh, that included 1,465 dives of 157 pregnancies. Um, the, people, the percent of women who stopped diving during the first trimester, uh, retrospectively back in the early 90s was only 65%. Nowadays it was higher than 90%. Uh, the spontaneous abortion rate was 14% and birth defects was 2.7%. And those are very similar uh, to rates in the USA and the EU for non-divers. So there they felt there was not any obvious increase in risk 
but still in the matter of safety is still strongly advised uh, women not dive uh, during pregnancy. Uh, the shot on the right is my wife uh, on the Tibbets in, um, in Cayman Brack. Other pregnancy issues, uh, other than just the concerns of, uh, of birth defects, pregnancy does increase obviously total body water and swelling of mucous membranes so that can make equalization difficult for pregnant women. Uh, two thirds of women have morning sickness and early pregnancy with nausea and vomiting, obviously that's a problem with diving. Uh, gastric reflux is very common and it's already common with immersion for any diver and you throw pregnancy with a large uh, gravid uterus uh, and heartburn can become a real major problem with diving. And the Japanese pearl divers who've had repeated cold water stress have a very high incidence of low birth weight uh, infants. So again, just something else to be concerned about. The other issues from a medical standpoint is should decompression illness occur in a pregnant woman, the fetus is now also a patient. So uh, whenever you have a pregnant woman, you actually have two patients to, to deal with. And it's unclear uh, as to with decompression illness, if either the mother or the fetus is at the higher risk uh, regardless if bubbles enter the fetal circulation, the degree of damage can be devastating. And we'll show it a slide in a minute. You have to realize that, uh, baby, uh, inf, uh, excuse me, um, that fetuses by definition have a patent frame of valley. That's how they get their oxygenated blood. So any venous bubbles uh, coming from the mother uh, going into the, cir the cardiac circulation of the uh, fetus will clearly cross across the, uh, the atrial septum, go into the left side of the circulation uh, and be sent to the brain, spinal cord, vital organs, and so forth. Um, and there's no data at all on fetal injury related to maternal hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So if you had a pregnant woman who had decompression illness, had to go into hyperbaric therapy uh, in a chamber, what does that do to the baby? Uh, we have no idea. So again, the answer is please just say no. If you've, you don't need to, that's, you know, you're not need to like abort a child because you were diving while you're pregnant. But if, uh, if a woman finds she's pregnant, she should stop diving uh, until after, uh, after delivery. So when can you re return to diving after pregnancy? Uh, after vaginal delivery, uh, immersion in water is prescribed and is advised against uh, for three weeks postpartum to allow the cervix to close uh, so as to limit the risk of ascending infection. In other words, at that point, up until three weeks, the cervix is still partially open. Um, and if you could easily get, women could easily get an infection uh, that would uh, go up into the uterus and cause problems. Uh, most women can return to exercise in earnest about three to four weeks postpartum after vaginal delivery. So at that point, you could easily return to diving. So the recommendation after delivery would be to wait three to four weeks. Uh, after cesarean section is like any other surgery, you normally would want to wait four to six weeks uh, before resuming full activities. And the only issue with breastfeeding uh, for women is a possibility of mastitis in the mother. Um, uh, and then the possibility of diarrhea in the infant should there be um, contamination of uh, bacteria from water under a wetsuit. And so that'd be very unlikely, but again, just theoretical kind of issues. This is what I was talking about before about the fetal circulation. So the main issue here is if you look at the, the placenta there on the bottom left, uh, that's how obviously the fetus is getting its oxygenated blood because the lungs are collapsed and full of fluid. So you see the red blood going up into the inferior vena cava. Uh, which is there below the liver. It's blue. The blue blood is the mother's blood, which is deoxygenated. But then the, uh, the oxygenated blood comes in from the umbilical vein into the IBC. Uh, and now you've got this um, blood going into the infant, uh, which is uh, oxygenated. The PFO is open, so that allows blood flow to, to bypass the right heart uh, and go into the, to the uh, central circulation oxygenated. So if the bubbles were there, that could obviously cause problems of decompression, illness, and air gas embolism to a, to a fetus. Okay, what about reconstructive surgery or breast augmentation and so forth? In the 1980s, uh, the Divers Alert Network began receiving calls with a concern about dissolved gas expanding on a commercial flight home, putting stress on the seams of breast implants. Uh, there was no data on this and Dan said, okay, we need to kind of figure out, is this a problem or not? Uh, and Dr. Van, uh, again at Duke in the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery back in 1988, uh, did a study. They looked at a variety of saline and gel uh, breast implants in a pressure chamber, uh, put it at normal body temperature. Uh, they put them at depths of up to 120 feet of salt water, and they left them at that depth for up to 72 hours. So again, lots of dissolved bubble, lots of dissolved gas. They then, after a 21-hour equivalent of a surface interval, 
Uh, they then took these implants to 7,000 feet, which is the equivalent of what a normal air, airline would fly at for approximately two hours. They then uh, also would take them to 30,000 feet for two hours. That's to simulate a loss of cabin pressure uh, to see what kind of changes they found on these uh, implants from the uh, dissolved gas. What they found is that when you went from depth uh, to the surface, there was about a 1% to 4% increase in the volume uh, at 7,000 feet. Uh, it was about a zero to five percent increase, and at thirty thousand feet, um, there was a little bit larger uh, increase in volume of up to twelve percent. The saline implants were less affected than gel implants. The bubbles all resolved over time, resolved over time, and this volume increase was not enough to cause any kind of risk of rupture along the seams of the breast implant. So that's diving uh, with breast implants not a problem. Taking an airline flight home after diving with breast implants definitely not a problem. So uh, after the surgery itself, uh, the recommendation varies. Uh, most people would say at least six weeks like you would with any surgery. Some surgeons recommend waiting several months, mainly because of the concerns of your, uh, your BC straps uh, being close to the lateral aspects of the, um, of the breast implants and that could potentially cause a problem. Um, if anybody cares, uh, saline implants obviously are neutral because they're saline. Silicone implants are a little bit negative. Um, so Depending on the size of your implants, you may or may not have to uh, uh, use less weight. Okay, diving and contraception. Uh, about 12% of women from the ages of 14 to 44 use oral contraceptives. And we know that oral contraceptives do increase the risk of uh, blood clots that can cause heart attack, uh, stroke, uh, deep venous thrombosis, that's blood clots in the legs, uh, and pulmonary emboli, which are blood clots going to the lungs. Um, this risk is very related to cigarette smoking. So young women or women, middle-aged women who do not smoke do not have a significant increased risk of these problems, heart attack, stroke, DVT, or pulmonary emboli. Uh, smokers, however, do have an increased risk. Uh, at less than one pack a day, the risk goes up about threefold. But if smokers who uh, smoke more than a pack a day have a 23 times higher risk uh, of stroke, heart attack, and DVT, pulmonary emboli compared to their non-smoking cohorts. Um, so this is just a, me on a soapbox saying, please, everyone should stop smoking. Uh, Non-smokers under the age of 35 have no uh, increased risk whatsoever. How about other, other issues with contraception? I'm gonna show you, mention this because I'm gonna talk about a case report uh, in just a couple of slides. Uh, Interuterine devices, uh, they have both hormonal and non-hormonal types. Uh, the hormonal types release small amounts of progesterone the non-hormonal types contain a copper uh, element and transform the uterus into a very hostile environment for sperm. And that's why they're not allowed, that's why they don't uh, latch on there. Uh, obviously this is very low maintenance in terms of uh, contraception, 99% uh, effective. It can last uh, as, high, as many as 12 years. Um, diving and menstruation. Please everyone realize that there is no increased risk of shark attacks on menstruating divers. Uh, sharks go after fish blood, not mammalian blood. Uh, and there's been absolutely no evidence whatsoever uh, that a menstruating female is at higher risk of shark attack um, than men or non-menstruating non women. Um, the only issue with menstruation is people who have, uh, who are chronically anemic from, uh, from heavy periods uh, could have a decreased exercise capacity from the anemia and from dehydration during their, uh, during their menstrual period. That'd be the only concern with that. Uh, menstrual cups. Um, as effective, I don't, I honestly, until I put this talk together, I didn't know anything about menstrual cups. Uh, menstrual cups can be as effective as pads or tampons. They can be left in place for up to 12 hours, can last up to 10 years and only cost about 40 bucks. Um, you do have to be a little bit careful because there have been several reported cases of toxic shock syndrome. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because of the, the next uh, case example. This was a diving instructor who contacted me uh, after I gave my original talk to tell me the story. Uh, his wife, uh, wife of a local diving instructor, joined him for a diving trip down to the Florida Keys. Uh, she uses a non-hormonal IUD for contraception. Uh, the diving that they were going to be doing occurred during her menses, uh, for which she uses a menstrual cup. Uh, she had not been previously diving with this combination of the IUD and the menstrual cup. Uh, they did two one-hour dives, uh, each to a maximum depth of 25 feet. They're in the shallow part of the Keys, so very, very low pressures. She had no issues during or immediately after diving. Uh, that evening, she had difficulty removing the menstrual cup. 
Um, when she was finally able to remove it, uh, she developed severe pelvic pain because the removing the cup, presumably from pressure changes, dislodged her IUD. Uh, it was unable to be reinserted in the emergency department down in the Keys, and she had to return home to her gynecologist to have the IUD reinserted. Um, this is obviously extremely rare. The only time I, I, I tried to do a literature search on this and found nothing except this one case report. The feeling is that there may have been a vacuum created with the increasing pressure uh, that did not uh, have enough time to reverse with return to the surface. And when she tried to remove uh, the menstrual cup, it caused enough suction to dislodge her IUD causing pelvic pain. So again, I, I wouldn't think this is a very common uh, problem, but just be aware of the fact that that combination could uh, result in a problem. Diving in menopause. 22% uh, of women divers uh, making eight or more dives per year are 55 years of age or older. I think that's fantastic. Uh, my wife is one of those people. So I think that's great. Um, the mean age of menopause is 50 years. Uh, osteopenia, which is beginning to have bone loss, uh, begins usually around age 60 to 65. Uh, and fractures because of the bone loss usually occur to women in their 70s. Uh, so women are at increased risk of osteoporosis due to the fact that just in general, their bone mass is lower uh, than it is in men and that the loss of estrogen during menopause greatly accelerates the rate of bone demineralization and making them weaker, uh, which is why a lot of people are on um, Fosamax and so forth. Uh, women who have significant osteoporosis of the spine should be cautioned about wearing tanks uh, with walking due to an increased risk of vertebral crush factors. Um, so those are, if, you, if you're if you very unfortunate, you're still diving and you're elderly in your 70s uh, and you know you have significant osteoporosis, it's probably not smart to be walking around on a, on a rocking boat wearing a tank on your back. Be, you'd be better served uh, by sitting on the swim step, having someone help you put your, your tank on, uh, and then getting in the water, and then taking it off in the water, and having somebody pull it back up on the boat for you, uh, just to avoid any kind of concerns with, uh, with vertebral fractures. Cardiovascular concerns. I've got to throw this in here near the, uh, the last part of things because of uh, my background. Approximately 100 scuba divers die every year. 25% uh, of deaths of scuba divers over the age of 35, not over the age of 65, over the age of 35, uh, are felt to be cardiac. Uh, the risk for cardiovascular death for premenopausal women is very, very low. Uh, it's not zero, but it's very, very low. Uh, it only kind of becomes a significant number in smokers or diabetics, and especially in diabetic smokers. Uh, but while women have a very low risk of cardiovascular death when they're premenopausal, uh, this risk quickly reaches that of men after menopause. And within 10 years of menopause, the risk of cardiovascular death uh, is equal among men and women in general. I'm gonna show you a, uh, a little clinical case. This, is, this actually was a man, but it's a, it, it, it proves a point. This is a true story. This is about 10, 15 years ago now. A gentleman had sudden death uh, at a gas station at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, he dropped dead pumping gas. Uh, there was bystander CPR performed. Um, EMS was called. They brought the patient to the emergency department where the EKG showed that he was having an acute uh, anterior wall MI. So you have a heart attack involving the front wall of his heart uh, and the STEMI team, that's the uh, ST segment, elevation myocardial infarction. Basically the heart attack team was called. So we all got woken up at uh, three o'clock in the morning, kind of circled the wagons and got into the hospital. Uh, this is what his EKG looked like. Uh, I don't expect anybody here, unless they're cardiologists, to read EKGs. But uh, if you look at those things that say V1, V2, V3, V4, those spiky things uh, are not what you want to be seeing. That's a big time heart attack. Um, so this is what's called a, this would be concerning for what's called the widow maker. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, there's not a good reason to call something the widow maker. So this is usually a very proximal LED that left untreated is frequently fatal. Uh, this person who dropped dead uh, had no history of smoking, no history of diabetes, no history of hypertension, no history of high cholesterol, and had no family history of coronary disease. Uh, however, that's not the most important part of things, which we'll get to here in just a second. Um, this is uh, the osteo ID, which doesn't project very well, this Widowmaker. He also had a blockage in what's called the circumflex, and he had a moderate blockage here in the right coronary artery. Uh, we put a stent in the LED. He actually did very, very well. So what's the most interesting part of this case, other than the fact that he had no risk factors? The major thing that's interesting here is he was only 32 years old. 
So we all like to think that cardiac disease is something that happens to elderly people, uh, but I can tell you from experience, it's not uncommon. It's a little uncommon to have people in their early 30s, but having people having heart attacks in their 40s and 50s is extremely common. Uh, so we see that all the time. So causes of death in the United States, we've mentioned about 100 people die scuba diving a year. How does that match up with other things? It matches up to about the same risk of swallowing a ballpoint pen and dying from that. Uh, and fewer people die scuba diving than die from falling coconuts. Um, so we're getting, obviously the United States, we have accidental gunfire of 1,500. I have no idea how 850 people a year get electrocuted by toasters, but that's, uh, that's what the statistics say. Okay, dive fatalities. Uh, the majority of dive fatalities occur either early or late in one's diving career. Uh, the people who die early is usually from inexperience. Uh, the people who die later are either from complacency or the fact that as they get more experienced, they're also getting older uh, and they have aging associated illnesses, especially uh, coronary artery disease later in life. Uh, younger deaths uh, tend to be more likely to be men. Older deaths are split equally between men and women. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, heart disease, uh, basically coronary artery blockages are involved in over 25% of scuba diving deaths and those over the age of 35 years of age. And again, I wanna emphasize that's over the age of 35, not over the age of 65. Oops, hit that again, sorry. So the growth of scuba diving since it began in the 50s has resulted in a large population of divers who are at risk for coronary disease, you know, people over the age of 45 for two reasons. Uh, those people like me uh, who began diving as teenagers uh, in the 70s uh, are now diving as they get older. And secondly, uh, there's increasing numbers of people over the age of 45 who are taking up scuba diving. So you have people who they, we've made scuba diving much easier uh, the equipment is much better. The training is much easier. Um, and you got people as they get older, having more uh, discretionary income, want to travel. And a lot of people start taking up scuba diving. The problem is that some of these people have underlying coronary issues. Uh, we're all getting older. Um, this is Arnold Schwarzenegger back in his day uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger now. So I'm sure Arnold likes to think he still looks like the picture on the left, when realistically he looks like the guy on the right. Uh, and not to just uh, admonish uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, but to uh, put myself into that perspective. Uh, this is me diving in 1978, uh, and this is me diving in, in 2020. So while in my mind, I'm still the guy that had just finished uh, you know, state championship swimming in 1978, um, that's not me anymore. I'm more like the guy on the left and I, I'm on the guy on the right, and I need to be aware of that when I do my diving. What may have been appropriate dives back in the 70s, probably not appropriate dives for me uh, anymore. This is the exception that proves the rule. This is um, Ron and Valerie Taylor when they were 80 and Stan Waterman at 86, uh, dive, shark diving with my buddy Jim Abernathy there uh, in the Bahamas. So this is what we all wanna be. We wanna be the people in their 80s are still enjoying scuba diving. So despite the decline in death from coronary disease since 1968, that's when the Surgeon General warning for uh, smoking came out, we still have about 650,000 Americans dying from coronary disease every year uh, with another 2 million developing problems um, of angina and so forth. The problem is that the most common presentation for having coronary artery disease is having a heart attack. You know, if people would just develop chest pain that we could pick up on a treadmill, uh, that would be easy. Uh, but the problem is the most common presentation is a heart attack. And actually, sudden death actually is, a, is the presentation in another 15 to 20 percent. So that's the concern is we can't necessarily pick all these people up uh, ahead of time. And their first presentation may either be death or a severe heart attack. And coronary disease is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death while scuba diving. And I bring this up because if someone drops dead on the golf course, uh, it's not logged as a golfing death. However, if the same event happens to someone scuba diving, it makes the news as a scuba diving death. So we all need to be kind of aware of that. Um, here are the class risk factors. We all know this age, smoking, cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, family history. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures here on the right that I took. This is my father, uh, my wife, and our two kids when they were very young uh, in the Bahamas. I certified my father to scuba dive at age 79. Uh, and he dove into his mid 80s. The reason he wanted to get certified was exactly for this reason. Uh, he wanted to go scuba diving with his grandchildren. Uh, and this, he loved that, it made a ma major impact in his life. So because of the fact that we have these people who are dropping dead and we have people getting into the, the sport later in life, um, how do we screen for coronary disease in people? 
And the way to do that is basically like we would for anybody who wants to take up some form of exercising. If I had a couch potato come to me who was 45 years old and said, I've decided to take up jogging, uh, then I would say, you know what, before you take up jogging, let's put you on a treadmill. Uh, and the same thing is probably very reasonable for scuba diving uh, is to put people on the on a treadmill if they're over the age of 40 before, when they're taking this up, if they've not been very physically active before. If people are very, very poorly conditioned, even under 40, you may want to consider that. It's always been recommended to, to participate in scuba diving. You'd be able to hit 13 mets on a treadmill. I will tell you that I don't know who I'm, who the the um, the audience is here, but my suspicion is other, I saw Megan uh, hanging career there. Other than Megan, who I'm sure could do this, uh, the vast majority of people in this audience are probably not going to be able to hit 13 mets on a treadmill. Uh, that's 12 minutes, and that's going to be basically either the fastest you can walk or a slow jog um, at a very steep incline. The reason that comes into play is because of some exercise physiology data uh, where that if you can hit 13 mets um, peak exercise, you should be able to sustain about half of that or six and a half mets for 20 or 25 minutes. So that's basically walking a 12 minute miles about six and a half minute, uh, about six and a half mets. So if you can walk two miles in 24 minutes, uh, that's probably adequate exercise for recreational diving. And I tell people that you don't scuba dive to get in shape. Uh, you get in shape to scuba dive because if you are getting in shape by scuba diving, you're probably doing it wrong. You know, it, it should not be that physically demanding in the vast majority of circumstances. Uh, if you happen to be one of the unlucky people who have coronary disease, contraindications of diving are basically if you have angina, uh, if you've had a heart attack that left you with a weak heart muscle, or you have dangerous rhythms when you exercise. Uh, if people have had balloons, stents, or bypass surgery, and they now have a normal treadmill, and they have normal heart muscle function, uh, with good treadmill testing every year, they should easily be able to return to scuba diving without any restrictions. So, Doug, I, Doug, I have a quick question. Sure. What is a MET? Oh, good. I'm sorry. Very good question. I'm, I apologize. Uh, a MET is a metabolic equivalent. So one MET is basically what you and I are doing right now. Okay, so basically doing nothing uh, is one MET. Um, if you're playing like doubles tennis, you're probably looking at a few METs of activity. If you're playing singles tennis, you're probably in the six or eight. If you're running at a fast pace, you're probably 12, 14 METs. So that's, that's kind of how those numbers kind of come into play. So again, what you're looking for, that six and a half is being able to walk about two miles in 24 minutes. So it's a, it's a good pace, but, uh, but most people should be able to do that. Sorry Thanks. about that, good, very good question, okay. thank you. Um, so in conclusion, uh, it looks like women are at increased risk of decompression illness during the first week of their menses, statistically compared to the rest of the menses, and, and that the third week is probably the lowest risk. Uh, the risk of decompression illness while on oral contraceptives is unclear. We talked about that because it's a pharmaceutically driven um, cycle and it varies in length, so it makes, makes doing research very difficult, so it's unclear. Uh, diving should be stopped as soon as a woman knows she's pregnant. It's unclear what the fetal effects are, uh, but there have been some reports of very bad birth defects. And again, should a woman who's pregnant become uh, a victim of decompression illness, we now have two um, patients to worry about, and it's unclear as to how that could best be treated uh, in a recompression chamber. Uh, breast implants can swell when going from hyperbaric to hyperbaric environments, meaning from diving to air travel, but not enough to result in any rupture. Uh, osteoporosis with aging can put women at risk for spinal compression fractures. So women with significant osteoporosis should try to avoid wearing heavy tanks on their back, especially in rocking boats because of the concern of the development of a fracture. And realize that while we think of cardiovascular disease as a male dominated disease, uh, once women are past menopause, it's an issue for both men and women about equal uh, risk. And that's about 45 minutes in. And now I want to make sure I left time for questions if I got this or anything else that people had. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, as an instructor, I can't even begin to explain how many times women have kind of pulled me inside and said, I have, I have a lady question for you. And sometimes I don't know the answers because we don't go through this nearly as much as we should. So it was really cool to um, get answers to some of those questions. But of course, I do have some questions from the audience here. Um, I didn't hear much about hormone replacement therapy in diving. Has there been any studies on that? Uh, no, the, uh, you know, the, the issues would be very similar to those of birth control pills. Um, we, 
from a cardiology perspective, we don't recommend a lot of hormone re uh, replacement therapy. That's actually done for symptoms. It used to be done for, the feeling was it was done for lessening the cardiac risk. Um, we thought that uh, women who are postmenopausal because they had higher incidence of coronary disease uh, that had been previously protected by um, hormone replacement therapy that we should give those people hormone replacement therapy to lower their cardiac risk. Turns out that actually increases the cardiac risk. Uh, but we have no data on what it does from a diving standpoint. No reason to think it would make any significant difference. Cool, thanks. Um, any risk of infection after an IUD insertion? Uh, should not be. Uh, you'd want to make sure that the, uh, and I, I would have to ask, you'd have to ask your gynecologist, once the IUD was in place, um, you'd want to make sure the cervix was completely closed. Uh, and I would basically ask the, the your gynecologist, once the IUD is placed, when is my service going to be completely closed, you know, back to normal, and at that point, return to diving. They may want to wait a few days or a week or something just to be extra cautious, but beyond that, it should not be a problem. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Dr. Doug, if your wife or your daughter was going to get breast reconstruction, would you suggest saline or gel? Uh, I would, to be honest with you, to be honest with you, I'd let them make that decision among, uh, by Fair themselves. Enough. But um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, there were there were reports in the past of, of saline, excuse me, of, of uh, silicone implants um, that were leaking that caused um, lots of symptoms. Whether that developed an autoimmune disease or what was going on, that's fairly unclear, depending on which studies you read. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of people have gone more to uh, saline implants. Uh, women have said that the, the, the silicon implants feel more natural. But again, I, as a cardiologist, I'm not going to make that recommendation. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's between the, uh, the woman and their plastic surgeon, in my mind. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, let's see here. A woman in our audience recent, or previously had decompression sickness. Is it advisable to dive with nitrox, but still using standard air tables? Okay. The... Um, if people have had decompression illness, whether a man or a woman, um, the issue, as we all know, is the inert gas bubble. So anything that you can do to limit uh, the inert gas loading will lessen your, your risk of decompression illness in the future or for, or for the first time. And one of the ways to do that uh, is, as was mentioned, which is diving nitrox but having your computer set to air. Uh, because what that will do is your computer will tell you you need to get out of the water when if you really looked at the table or the computer set property nitrous, you'd have more time. So it adds a level of conservancy. I think that's a very good idea uh, not to push your computers for anyone, but especially if you've had problems with recompression or with uh, decompression illness in the past. The other ways to be protective uh, are diving shallower. Uh, obviously, deeper dives have more gas loading. So diving shallower, meaning less than 100 feet. Uh, diving fewer dives per day, so one or two dives per day rather than four or five dives per day like on a liveaboard. Uh, like you mentioned, um, diving nitrox but having your computer set to air. Uh, and the other thing you can do to dive conservatively is extend safety stops. Um, so doing five or seven minute safety stops rather than three minute safety stops uh, is the other way uh, to do this. All those things are and have been studied in people with decompression illness uh, and have been shown to decrease the likelihood of repeat decompression illness in the future, whether the men or women. Um, I think this is my favorite question thus far because most of us ladies know the answer already. But yeah, the men has, probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> has there been any study on the air consumption between women and men? Um, women have lower air consumption than men, but it's mainly because of body size. Um, in general, because no, no, we're okay. awesome. Okay, in general, <laughs> uh, women tend to be of smaller frame than men. Uh, in general, uh, women tend to have smaller lung capacities than men. Um, in general, uh, women have uh, less body mass, and less muscle mass than men. So all those things combined uh, usually mean that women will have a lower um, air consumption compared to men. And you could say the same thing about boys versus men. You know, uh, younger people tend to have a lower air consumption than older people. Again, they're smaller size and all that sort of thing. So that, that's where that comes from. But yes, that's very, very common. And I'm sure all the women who dive with their husbands are used to saying, what do you mean it's time to go up? I still have 1,500 pounds left. <laughs> uh -huh. And we all know it. We all know it. Um, I like to call it the woman superpower in scuba diving. And then men call it the rebreather, the great equalizer. 
<laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> um, another question here from Michelle. If I have had a successful ASD closure with an interventional device over a year ago, what are your recommendations on my diving in the future? Yeah, First of all, what is, what is an ASD? Okay, okay, I'll go roll that. Uh, what she's getting at is, if you remember that uh, picture I showed um, of the cartoon of the diagram of the fetal heart, uh, the fetal heart, the, the wall between the two, I, don't, I am getting to the answer to the question, but it's gonna take me a little bit of time to no get problem. there to explain. The, uh, the wall between the two bottom chambers is a solid wall. The wall between the two top chambers for a fetus is not a, a solid wall. Uh, it tend, the wall grows up from the bottom and grows down from the top. And in a normal heart, um, this, this results in a flap, an overlap uh, of the two walls. And that's what's called the patent frame and ovale. That's the little flap that allows the blood to cross from the right side to the left side when the baby's a fetus. Uh, and then when you're born, that trap door is slammed shut. And in about 75% of people, that becomes a solid wall. Uh, within the first year or two of life and everything's good. In about 25% of people, they still have this little flap uh, and that's people you've heard about that have had uh, decompression illness from a PFO and some of those get those closed. I closed lots and lots of those. Uh, an atrial septal defect, what happens is as the heart's wall is forming and that wall is growing up from the bottom uh, and growing down from the top, the walls don't overlap. They actually stop and never meet. So since they never meet, there's a hole left there. Does that make sense? So you've got a wall sticking up from the bottom, a wall coming down from the top, but they don't meet, so there's a hole in the middle. That's called, because that's the atrial septum, that's called the an atrial septal defect or an ASD. So that's basically a hole in the heart, a very common uh, congenital abnormality. Uh, we used to have to close those surgically by taking a piece of pericardium and surgically closing the hole. We now have devices that look like two discs um, connected by a pin. Uh, and you basically can put one disc on the left side, one disc on the right side, and this kind of plugs the hole. It usually takes about three months uh, for your body to kind of completely heal that over kind of with scar tissue and make it a solid wall. So the recommendation is in people who've had a whole, either a PFO or an atrial septal defect, um, once they've had it closed with a device, uh, if you go three months post-procedure, and then get, get a regular echocardiogram, an ultrasound test of the heart, uh, and they inject some bubbles in your arm. You make sure that none of those bubbles cross over. Uh, if you've got that situation three months after the procedure, uh, you can return to diving with no restrictions. So if someone's a year out, and they've had a follow-up echo sometime after the procedure to show the device was in good position and not leaking, uh, they can return to diving with uh, no greater risk of decompression illness than the general population. Awesome, that's good news, Michelle. Uh, if I remember correctly, you went into a little bit more detail on that on one of your recent seminars with us. I think it was the five most common questions you get. Right, probably so. Yep. So if anybody has more questions about that, you're also more than welcome to um, have a look. It's on our YouTube page and for sure our Facebook page. So if you want to have a look at that seminar too, again, it's called the five most common questions I, meaning Dr. Doug, gets as a Dan cardiologist. Um, and just a quick reminder, if anybody has questions, there's a little button right down here um, is for a chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to chat those to me, pretty please, and I will go ahead and relay them. I have another one from Audrey here. She is curious if there's any data on women diving with the arm in, implant, excuse me, for breast, uh, breast control, oh my goodness, birth control. Oh, for like depo, sh like a depo shots. Uh, it should be, no, it's ba that's basically, um, again, the equivalent from a cardiology perspective, not an OBG perspective, but basically a long acting oral contraceptive pill. So it'd be the same issues as with oral contraceptive, with any kind of um, a hormonal manipulation. So uh, the same issues from um, birth control pills, which would be the same, which is we have no data to think it'd be any, any higher risk or lower risk. So that should not be a problem at all. No. Let me double check, make sure there's no other questions in here. Can you dive with a controlled AFib? And if you could explain AFib, please. Sure. Um, atrial fibrillation is the most common uh, cardiac arrhythmia that we deal with. What, if you guys think back to biology class, um, your heart has four chambers, two on the top, two on the bottom. Uh, the top chambers contract to fill the bottom chambers. The bottom chambers then contract to pump blood. Uh, that's, how the, that's how the heart's supposed to work. Well, your heart has to have its own pacemaker of sorts to tell it how to do that. 
Um, there's not going to be a quiz, so don't worry, but your heart has what's called the SA node, uh, which is its own pacemaker in the top right um, atrium that fires impulses at your normal 60, 80 beats a minute, whatever, um, through the two top chambers, causing them to contract simultaneously. There's then a little pause in what's called the AV node, the, the electrical node between the top and bottom chambers, um, to kind of give the bottom chambers a chance to fill. Then the wiring continues and the bottom chambers contract. So you know, what you normally get is this top contraction, pause, bottom contraction. That's how it's supposed to work. With atrial fibrillation, what happens is rather than this very synchronized electrical activity coming from this SA node in the top of the right atrium, is the, the atrium become very chaotic and they basically quiver. Uh, and when they quiver, they quiver both electrically and mechanically. What I mean by that is when they quiver electrically, they're actually firing off impulses to the bottom chambers at up to 300 beats a minute. Um, thankfully, that little node between the two top, top and bottom chambers can't take 300 beats a minute. But in some people, it can take 150 or 160 and make it feel like your heart's coming out of your chest. Um, so one aspect of therapy is slowing that rate down or kind of controlling the rate. Uh, and keeping it in the 80s or 90s or whatever. Uh, and if that's the case, it's well controlled. There's no problem from diving from that standpoint. The other issue with atrial fibrillation is when the top chambers are literally quivering uh, and not contracting, blood up there can get stagnant. Uh, blood that gets stagnant forms clots. Clots can then go bad places like strokes. So the major medical issue with atrial fibrillation is not the rate. We can usually control that. Um, it's the risk of stroke. Uh, and developing atrial fibrillation increases your stroke risk by fivefold. So depending on what your stroke risk was, it could be you've got a very, very low stroke risk at baseline. So multiplying that by five still gives you a very, very small number. But in a lot of people, they may have a, a kind of a moderate stroke risk to begin with, and you multiply that by five and it becomes a very high risk of stroke. So those people are who are the ones that put on blood thinners. So those people who are things like Coumadin, the ones you hear about on TV, like Pradaxa, Eliquis, Xeralto. So the questions with diving with atrial fibrillation are twofold. One is the rate control. So are they, if they are rate controlled, uh, so their heart's not going real fast and it's not debilitating to them, there's no reason not to dive. The second question is, can you dive on blood thinners? Uh, that is a relative contraindication to diving, meaning that you need to take a, a case by case um, discussion with the patient. Um, if you are diving on blood thinners, you are more likely to have bleeding uh, than if you're not on blood thinners. It tends to be nuisance bleeding. It doesn't tend to be life-threatening bleeding. Uh, if you were to have barotrauma, you know, ear barotrauma, sinus barotrauma, you would probably bleed into that area more likely than if you did not have that. So you'd want to be careful with um, equalization issues and not diving with, uh, with sinus congestion. There is a theoretical risk uh, that if God forbid you were diving on a blood thinner and you developed decompression illness, which you know only happens two per 10,000 dives. And if that decompression illness happened to be a brain or spinal cord issue, that maybe you would be more likely to bleed into that being on blood thinners and have a greater deficit than if you're not on blood thinners. Those are all very theoretical arguments. So that's why it's kind of a case by case basis. But there are lots of people who dive on uh, with atrial fibrillation, well controlled on medications, and even diving on blood thinners. That's a kind of a long winded answer to a very that's, short question, but <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's great. Um, you started. You mentioned pacemakers, so that had a, a couple people wondering if you can dive with a pacemaker. Uh, that depends. Uh, the va the vast majority can definitely dive with pacemakers. There's two issues with diving with a pacemaker. Um, one is whether someone is pacemaker dependent, uh, meaning that is the pacemaker there as a backup uh, or is the pacemaker there and if, they, if it malfunctions, then they have no heart rhythm. Um, the reason that's important is because there can be some pressure changes uh, with, the, with the technology with, at depth. So we're, we're less concerned about people who have a pacemaker as a backup than we are about people who are quote pacemaker dependent. Um, so that would be a case by case discussion. The other issue with diving with a pacemaker is the depth rating, because there is air inside the pacemaker. So Boyle's law still applies. So as you go deep uh, and the volume changes, you can actually crush the pacemaker, theoretically. So all pacemakers have a depth rating. 
Um, it has nothing to do with scuba diving. Uh, it usually is due to wound care because wound care, you'll put people in hyperbaric chambers. So if you have a di you know, you have an elderly diabetic with a foot wound who has a pacemaker, you want to know, can you safely put them in, in a hyperbaric chamber to treat the wound infection? Not, they don't really care about us scuba divers. But anyway, so because of that, the, um, a lot of the, all the pacemakers have a depth rating. The majority of those are around a hundred feet. Um, the, uh, most of the ones by Medtronic are about 100 feet. Most of the ones by Boston Scientific are about 130 feet. Um, there is a pacemaker by St. Jude that's rated to 198 feet. Um, and that's important because I have a friend of mine who's in his early 70s, I've been diving with for a very long time, who started having episodes of passing out uh, and people thought he was having decompression illness. It turns out he was having complete heart block. So he needed a pacemaker. He was certified to dive rebreathers to 330 feet. Obviously, I couldn't do that for him. Uh, but we did get him a pacemaker that was rated to 198 feet. And I actually was just diving with him two days ago down to 180 feet uh, in Pompano Beach. And he's doing fine. So, yes, you can dive with a pacemaker. You just got to be aware of the pacemaker dependent versus not pacemaker dependent. Uh, you know, is it a backup or is it the only thing you have? Uh, and then be aware of the depth rating of the device you have. I never again, again a long-winded wow. answer to a simple question. Amazing! I had never wondered what the uh, pressure rating on a pre uh, pacemaker was before, <laughs> so that, that's awesome. It's going to come up in. So, uh, oh my goodness, what's the word I'm looking for? Never mind. It'll come to me in a minute. We have enough. <laughs> it'll come to you three o'clock in the morning tonight. Definitely, that's always when the good ideas come. Um, are holes in the heart common enough that people should be? checked out, especially if they're divers? No, um, no. And the reason being, the main, the main thing those people have would, would not be an atrial septal defect like the question before, mm -hmm. uh, but would be what's called a patent foramen ovale. So that's the flap we we're talking about. Again, like I mentioned about 75% of people, uh, that flap will completely close by about one to two years of life and it's a solid wall, which means about 25% of people. So I don't know how many people are on this uh, Zoom call at the moment, but probably, you know, a dozen or so of us uh, on this call probably have a patent frame of valley. So there's, you know, one out of four people have a flap. Um, so that sounds concerning. So the question is, okay, what does that really do in terms of your risk of decompression illness? It turns out that having a PFO probably increases your risk of decompression illness by about fivefold, which sounds really bad on the surface. But what you have to look at is the absolute risk, not the relative risk. So if the average risk of decompression illness for recreational diving is somewhere around two episodes per 10,000 dives, let's say, if you multiply that by five, that would be 10 episodes per 10,000 dives or a risk of one in a thousand. So the likelihood of having decompression illness from your PFO is about one in a thousand, okay? I would like to think that I am quite good at closing PFOs because I do lots and lots of them but I can guarantee you that my complication rate is higher than one in a thousand. Uh, so from a risk benefit ratio, it doesn't make sense to close them. Fair enough, that's great. That's why we don't look. So the recommendation right. is not to routinely look. <laughs> uh, if people have recurrent, uh, if, if, while we're talking about PFOs, if people have recurrent episodes of unexpected, what we call used to call undeserved, but we say unexpected uh, decompression illness, um, of, of one of four types. The four types would be cerebral, so stroke-like symptoms, uh, spinal, which would be paralysis or urinary retention, uh, inner ear, which would be vertigo uh, or skin bends. So one of those four types recurrently uh, and unexpected, those people should be screened for a PFO uh, because that, those are the types that are associated with PFO. If a PFO is found, um, people could either stop diving, which nobody who comes to see me has chosen that. Uh, and obviously that makes sense. You don't dive, you don't get bent. Um, you can either dive conservatively, like we talked about before. So you would be diving shallower, fewer dives per day, diving nitrox uh, with air, pro air, you know, computer set to air, doing long safety stops and so forth. Or you could have a PFO closed um, in selected, you know, very selected cases. Again, once more, I, a long-winded answer to a very simple question. My mind is just blown. I'm loving all the information. And bar trivia was what I was trying to think of. Oh, bar trivia. Okay, there you go. <laughs> been a long week. Uh, a couple more questions here. Do you have any recommendations on precautions related to bi diabetics? There's a whole Dan uh, um, 
proceedings on the Dan website on diving with diabetes. Uh, it used to be felt that you should not dive with diabetes and it was actually uh, a, a contraindication to diving. The problem with me makes it a contraindication is people continue to dive with diabetes and they just don't tell you they have diabetes. So a, a better way to do it is find out who can safely dive with diabetes. Uh, the vast majority of people who are diabetic can safely dive with diabetes unless they're very, very brittle. Um, the main problem with diving with diabetes is not having blood sugars that are too high. It's developing blood sugars that are too low while diving. It's not uncommon for blood sugars to drop 70 to 100 points scuba diving. So uh, a normal blood sugar is around 100. Um, if you're diabetic and let's say it's running 130, 140, and all of a sudden it drops to 70 or 80, you're going to be have a hypoglycemic event underwater and can lose consciousness underwater. So the main issue with with diabetes is not getting hypoglycemic, not developing low blood sugars. So it's recommended people monitor their blood sugars carefully on the diving day. Um, people should not have had to have been hospitalized for diabetes within the last year, uh, and they should not have had diabetic complications. And then from a medication standpoint, the a lot of the medications for diabetes are prone to cause hypoglycemia. Others are not. Um, in the old days, back when I was an intern and resident, all we really had were things like glipizide and uh, insulin, both of which are very prone to cause hypoglycemia. Those are not recommended uh, if you can get away with it. Uh, drugs like metformin, which is now kind of a, a first-line therapy for diabetes, does not cause hypoglycemia. So that's a very good choice. Um, additionally, the new SGLT2 inhibitors, things like Farsiga and Genuvia, uh, do not cause hypoglycemia. So and those are felt to be kind of second-line therapies now. So it's, if, you, if you're a diabetic uh, and you want to scuba dive, uh, the key is just following your blood sugars carefully in your diving day. Let your blood sugar be a little high. Being a little high is not a problem. It's being too low that's going to be the problem. Uh, and work with your internal medicine doctor or your endocrinologist uh, to say you're diving and you're concerned about drugs that could possibly cause hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, uh, and try to be on medications uh, that are not prone to cause that. Awesome. Any recommendations to keep people, especially our lovely ladies here, safe diving well into their 70s and 80s? Uh, just like anybody else, you would want to, uh, as we get older, um, there are certain things we can control, certain things we can't. Um, diet, exercise, and flexibility are the main things we lose. You know, basically, as we get older, we lose muscle mass, uh, we lose flexibility, we lose cardiovascular conditioning. So uh, all of us, as we get older, should have a three-pronged approach. We should do something... Uh, from terms of cardiovascular fitness, whether it be walking, jogging, swimming, something, something cardiovascular. Uh, we should do some sort of resistance training, uh, whether that be push-ups, sit-ups, whether that be elastic bands, whether that be, you know, whatever, planks, whatever, whatever you want to do, some sort of resistance training to develop uh, for muscle mass. Uh, and thirdly, some level of flexibility. So stretching, yoga, something, Pilates, something like that. So that's kind of a three-pronged approach. Uh, and then other things just to stay healthy. So you know, if you're a woman, make sure you're getting your mammogram, make sure you're getting your pap smears. If you're a man, make sure you're getting your prostate checked. Everybody should be getting their colonoscopies. Nobody should smoke. Um, everybody should have a decent diet. Uh, we should all be vegetarians, but it's hard for 99% of us to do that. Um, and then women should be very careful also uh, about osteoporosis. So be very careful about bone, bone density loss and treat that early and aggressively. Um, if you maintain good exercise tolerance, you maintain good flexibility, you maintain strength, um, you don't develop the cancers that would be preventable, uh, and for women, you avoid osteoporosis, uh, then with a little luck, you should be able to dive into your 70s and 80s, hopefully. That's the goal. That's the goal. All right, last question. Um, we were wondering if men should also stop diving during pregnancy. <laughs> If men, if, if men get pregnant, they should definitely stop diving. That would be a very good idea. Stop, stop diving in solidarity. Do it. Let's do it. That's the that's the a, that question. No, all, no, all kidding aside, that's a that's a really big problem because you know, look around at um, look around at no. dive centers. You know, when you go when you travel, a lot of dive masters are young women, uh, and they make their living diving. So if they're told not, they find out they're pregnant. You know month or two in, they got to stop diving for seven or eight months of no income. That's a major problem. No, we don't have a good, sure. we don't have a good solution for that, but that is a major problem. Whereas their male counterpoint, counterparts can keep diving. Even the male counterpart who got them pregnant could keep diving, right? It doesn't sound fair. 
not allowed. Dr. Doug, so many, so many thanks for pouring through. Thank you so much for coming back. We're so happy to have you. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating information. Um, so thank you so much. You're very You're welcome and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Yay, Yay. Mama. Thank you, thank you. Hey, can you, you hear are... me, Doug? Hey, I hear you, Steve, what's up? I just wanna say thanks and uh, I'm sure everybody here wants to say thanks as well. All right, well, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Doug. You're very, very welcome. Give and, your wife uh, my best. Pardon me? Give you, oh, Give your I, I will. My best too. And thanks again uh, for the uh, for the champagne back uh, seven months ago now, or six months ago now. Greatly yeah. appreciate it. No worries. Where are you going? But for those of you who don't know, I, I know you know what a wonderful person Steve is, uh, oh, yeah. but I'll, I'll blow his horn a little bit. Uh, you guys were at St. Lucia at Anse Chantenay uh, the week before uh, we went there. And uh, Steve actually had a bottle of champagne left in my wife's and my room so that they left the same day we arrived and it was waiting for us when we arrived. So that was wow. way above and beyond the call. So everybody give a round of, uh, of applause Yay. to Steve. <laughs> So, Dr. Doug, you're kind of kicking off our little summer of scuba thing that we have going on this summer to kind of get people back into scuba diving and hopefully seeing everybody's faces some more. So your first event and as always a favorite. So everybody else that's out there, keep an eye on our email blast so you see what else we've got coming up. We've got things like good sales coming up. We've got watch on the walk coming up. Um, all sorts of good stuff. So hopefully we will see some more of your beautiful smiling faces very, very soon. So Dr. Doug, thank you so much for being our kickoff. Always awesome to have you. Oh, it's just, if you do something in the future, just let me know. I'd be glad to help. Thank Perfect. You. Take care. Thanks, Doug. Bye, Doug. Bye thank you. Thanks, Doug. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye now.